bodies relax. Conversation. Let's try that again. Maybe I shouldn't touch it. Welcome. When we sit down across the table with a friend, our bodies relax and yet are alive with anticipation of conversation. Listening to and being heard fills us with joy. When we sit down across the table at Love Feast with members of our church, family, guests, maybe first-time attenders or lifelong attenders, we know that we are moving into holy space, into a ritual not only of Jesus' last meal and evening with his disciples, but we are moving into the holy space of the ritual of community. We see one another, we pass food to one another, we break bread with one another. When we come into the sanctuary at the start of this ritual love feast of community and holy reenactment, our bodies settle into the space for holy receiving. We know there will be a silence that is permeated with God's presence. That presence is not to shame or judge. This presence of God in our time of self-reflection and examination offers us sacred companionship to see what we often don't want to see, offering a breath of life to walk toward confession, forgiveness, and healing. So settle in. We'll hear a word of assurance from scripture and some shared thoughts. We'll share time in silence to allow yourselves, allow each of us to be aware of what is whole and what is broken in our own relationships. And after the silence, when the music begins and we sing the words, O oh God, we call you are welcome to come forward to light a candle for what has risen within you. And once we're all settled again, sitting back in the pews, I will invite you to take your bulletin and your hymnal and we'll quietly move into the narthex and sit close to one another. We invite those who do not eat meat, our vegans and vegetarians, to sit with Gwen. Um, if you want to sit somewhere else, that is also fine. Um, the soup, the special soup for you will be where Gwen is, and so you can come and fill your bowl. As we, enter, as we enter into this hymn of preparation, I want you to invite you to just take in these words. Gwen and David and I will sing it the first time, and then you're invited to join in as the, as the song continues.
For you, return to your God. Hold fast to love and justice and wait continually on your God. These words come from the prophet Hosea, and they come from a tumultuous time of power shifts, loss of peace, changes in security, and the people had leaned too hard into the surrounding practices that beckoned them away from God. The language in this book is hard and it is incriminating, yet it is not without love and restoration. Return to your God, hold fast to love and justice, and wait continually for your God. It is a reminder that it is never too late. Now is the time to turn to the way of God, a way of mercy and steadfastness and wholeness. This requires a turning away from what we hold as idols, the things that cause us to hope in what brings false hope, to follow and believe what does not spring from goodness, community, right actions. We hold our grudges, perceived wrongs, hurt feelings, status, opinions, just like the people in the day of Hosea, held to the idols that were not God. We all have relationships in our closest families or friendships or coworkers or neighbors or fellow students that are easy and forgiveness comes without a second thought. And we also have brokenness within us. When we have let someone down or they have hurt us with words or actions. Now in this sanctuary, you will find a safe space to let your mind acknowledge those truths. And if you are out of balance with someone, let that sit within your heart and mind, and the way forward will be made clear to you. This is holy encounter. So have courage and be not afraid. Return to God, hold fast to love and justice, and wait continually for your God. The truth and kind action of that truth, it will set you free. And the reverberations of that freedom will set another free until chains of shame and guilt, blame and hurt are softened into human compost for love and justice to flourish. 
This is the way of God. It is the way of Jesus, God incarnate, who taught and lived and died, showing us this holy way. The prophet Hosea speaks for God in these words. I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew of Israel. They shall blossom like the lily. They shall strike root like the forests of Lebanon. Their shoots shall spread out. Their beauty shall be like the olive tree and the fragrance like that of Lebanon. And they shall again live beneath my shadow. They shall flourish as a garden. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fragrance shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answers and looks after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. Your fruit comes from me. Hosea goes on to say, those who are wise understand these things. Those who are discerning know them. For the way of the Lord, the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But the transgressors stumble in them. Please pray with me. Jesus, you are God with us. You hold all of our human folly within you. May we know you within ourselves now with clarity and wonder and possibility for wholeness offered to another and wholeness actioned into our own beings through your way of living. Come to us in our silence. Come to us in the acknowledgement of your clarity as we light the lights. Come to us as we symbolically enact your loving kingdom of community, service, and faithfulness. Your way is all around us, leading to life. May it be so. Amen.
take your bulletins and a hymnal as we move to be at table with one another out in the narthex. I'm going to read for us words from the Gospel of Luke 9, 12 through 17. The day was drawing to a close, and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away, so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all of these people, for there were around 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. And what was left over was gathered up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Let's sing together the words in your insert there, until all are fed.
Until all are fed, we cry out. Until all on earth have bread, like the one who loves us, each and every one we serve, until all are fed. Words of compassion. These are words of love, words of abundance. Such abundance that all are fed and there were leftovers. These are words that speak to encountering Jesus at the table. And not a physical table in the case of this story from Luke, but a group, in fact a quite large group, that gathers for a meal with Jesus. 5,000, it says. Has anyone served a meal for 5,000? Spontaneously at that. Imagine just serving a meal for this community, a couple of hundred people spontaneously after worship for a meal. Maybe I can see if the Fellowship Commission is up for exploring this idea. The disciples don't seem interested in serving 5,000 people either. They are ready to send the people away to care for themselves. There's a mindset of scarcity in this moment and a physical scarcity as it says that they are in a deserted place. And the disciples double down. They say, there's not enough unless we go and buy more food. There is not enough. And then, of course, there becomes more than enough. How do we encounter scarcity? The feeling that there is not enough. The scarcity of resources, of food, clean water, shelter, scarcity of imagination, of good health care, scarcity of education, of employment. And we, like the disciples, encounter scarcity of the mindset or the mindset of scarcity all the time. There's not enough until there becomes more than enough. May we encounter the divine who calls us into a mindset of abundance, abundant living where everyone is invited to the feast, where all are welcome at the table, where all will be filled and still there will be leftovers, where we take the five loaves and the two fish or take whatever that you have broken and blessed, serving until all are fed. Let us pray, and then we will sing and eat together. O oh God, be present at our table. Be here and everywhere. May we encounter you in ways of divine abundance. Let's turn to blue four, five, seven.
I'm going to invite us to move uh, into the for washing service, and I'm going to read from John 13, 1 through 17. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil, having already decided that Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, would betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he would come from God and was going to God, got up from supper, supper took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but you are going to wash my feet. Sorry, you, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Sorry. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, slaves are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus says there, towards the end of that passage, I have set an example for you. Do as I have done to you. And tonight, this is a symbolic act of humility and service. A posture that we seek to live out and express. A posture that we encounter in Jesus. Someone who washes the feet of Peter, knowing full well that Peter will deny him to save his own skin. Someone who stoops to wash the feet of Judas, knowing that Judas has already conspired to betray him. Someone who walks the path of forgiveness, nonviolence and reconciliation all the way to the cross, who says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Someone who says, do as I have done to you. It is a posture that can often be easier done symbolically and in the safety of close community. Peter is at first resistant, saying, you will never wash my feet. So I wonder for us, where are we resistant to take the posture of humility and service? To deny, to, to those who deny and betray us, who act and look differently than us. And where have we encountered Jesus? on our knees? Where do we need to take a posture of humility and service? So tonight we ask that you fill us with your love and you show us how to serve our neighbors. I want to offer a few instructions for us. There are four circles that are in the vestibule area out here and I'm told by the deacons but there will be deacons out there to tell you if, you, if you're wandering and it feels like you might need uh, assistance, they'll be standing up. But the two that are closest to the door are for the women, and the one uh, that is closest to the, the chapel area there, the, 
back left is for the is for the, for mixed, and then the closest one to the fireplace uh, is for the men. So there's four circles uh, there. Uh, as the singing begins, uh, we you are invited to move to one of those circles as you as you feel led. Now let me offer this prayer as we transition uh, into the service. Creator and loving God, in the act of kneeling to wash another's feet, may we kneel also in our hearts. Lives bowed in humility and service to your will and not our own. In allowing our feet to be washed, may our lives be cleansed with your forgiveness so that we may go forward freed from the bonds of despair to live in freedom and hope. In our washing of feet, cleanse our relationships with one another as well. May we, in washing one another's feet, forgive and accept forgiveness from one another for any hurts or wrongs or misunderstandings so that we may rise to sit together at your table in a renewed and strengthened fellowship. Amen. turn to uh, number 307. Will you let me be your servant? i 
let's turn to 580. My life flows on. My life flows on in endless song about the lamentations. I catch the sweet of all of him that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my Five twenty one, come thou found. Jesus. 
uh, 398. I love to tell the story. Number 356, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
Number 336, When Peace Like a River. Number, do we have time for another? Pardon? Yes. Let's do 327, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. Hearing these words, the disciples likely only had a glimpse of the depth of meaning. They would soon live and know so much more as Jesus' death unfolded before their very eyes and aching hearts. Yet whenever they ate or drank together, they would remember Jesus. And we know from our scriptural witness that they did in the upper room at Emmaus on the lake shore. They remembered. And now, let us remember that Jesus came and lived and died, declaring a way of life that is whole and good and welcoming for all people. No one is excluded. Here is our salvation. Thanks be to God. Let's sing number 60 together. On each table you will see a plate that has cups of grape juice and traditional communion bread and a square of gluten-free vegan bread. There should be at least one of those gluten-free vegan pieces on every table. And so if that is what you need to break, find yours, pass it down. And we might have to move some around in making sure everyone has what they need. Is there anyone who needs a piece? Then take the bread, the traditional or the gluten-free bread, and share it with the person across the table with you. And we will say these words that are written in your bulletins together. Sharing the bread, we say together, the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Break and eat. And now take a cup. Sharing the cup we say together, the cup which we bless is the communion of the love of Christ poured out for all.
Let's sing one verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Blessed be have sung words of faith and blessing. We have knelt and washed our humble humanity with each other. We have nourished one another, making sure everyone is fed. We have broken bread as Jesus broke bread in solemn remembrance. And now may our deep ritual of care, of love feast, move into the deep hands-on care of cleanup. For this is life, holy connection, and stacking of chairs, the spirituality, and the pragmatics. Our faith is to be practiced and lived in the everyday. In wholeness, love, and justice, we offer God's love to anyone we encounter. We give thanks for this full and abundant life we live together, and in the name of Jesus, who gathered with his friends this night so long ago. Amen.